I'd really like to tap into that final point you made, which is the, the contrast of we're extremely vulnerable on the one hand, we are ex-slaves, we know that. But on the other hand, the Torah is a story of God's intervention in our lives. And this is a question that I've never really fully had, a, had an answer for, which is basically, does the, is the Torah there to tell us that life is going to be challenging, you're going to be vulnerable, um, and just cl cling to God through it? Or is it telling us, you know, and, you know or, or is it telling us that not only should you cling to God through it, but by clinging to God through it, that will ease your suffering, God will take away your suffering. So for example, it says, you know, if you, examples of, you know, we say when we, when we put the Torah away on Shabbat mornings, uh, that, God, that the Torah's ways are ways of, uh, you know, uh, peace and pleasantness and, you know, following that path and, and God will uh, provide for you. Uh, there's many instances where the Torah seems to say this, but on the other hand, I think of someone like Rabbi Akiva, who he kept, he kept everything. He was the, you know, one of the greatest men of all time and yet he was burned to death. Um, uh, by the Romans. So, ha what what's the what exactly is ha how does it work? You know, how does this covenant work? Again, uh, good, very good questions and ones that uh, need to be asked. Th there are different approaches to this in in Jewish thinking, and I'll I'll share with you perhaps the perspective of the uh, Rambam Maimonides on the matter. Um, and the first point to be made is that uh, in his thinking, and indeed this seems quite clear when one looks at the Torah. Um, the Torah does not guarantee to us or offer us a promise of an easy and smooth life. Um, quite the contrary, it, it very much speaks about the idea that human beings uh, face challenges, we face difficulties. Um, it tells us the story of the lives of our greats, our forefathers, our foremothers, and uh, very often very challenging and difficult lives. They didn't have smooth lives at all. On the contrary, um, in one remarkable line, the Talmud tells us that Sadiqim, righteous people, they don't have rest and ease not in this world and even not in the world to come because if life is about choices and choices are about change then by definition we always need to be in motion we always need to be moving and moving means that if today i am here tomorrow i am elsewhere and if tomorrow i'm elsewhere it means i'm no longer here there's always a sacrifice built into that every second of life is a moment of new life but also a bereavement and a loss of the experiences and the life that I had just moments before. And that's the essence of what it means to be alive. And life, only when life ceases, does one cease to lose and cease to, cease to suffer loss. So the Torah doesn't hold out um, guarantees or promises of uh, an easy life and a smooth life. Quite the contrary, um, it tells us that life sometimes will be challenging. And um, yes, that trite expression, challenges are to be embraced. That's all we can do. It also tells us that we're not in control of our fate. It tells us that belief in God doesn't mean some sort of mystical affirmation that somehow we have the uh, magical insight to uh, read always history with clarity or to know what's uh, going to be. And sometimes attempting to do so is, is misunderstanding uh, actually the, the message that lies behind it, which is that we're not always in control of our fate. Um, so what, what can we do about that? How can we approach this? And, um, and here I want to use an analogy. It's really the, the uh, Rambam's analogy, Maimonides analogy, but I'll just, I'll just give a, uh, a modern version of it. And, and he says that we need to go through life. And perhaps this is the greatest truth that we human beings can know. We need to go through life aware that every second of life is a free gift, unearned. We don't have a right to life. It's a gift that's being given to us. And this can come across in, in a very heavy way and in a, a depressing way, but it also can be a life affirming way. And let me just give you a little analogy. If, um, imagine one's, one's skydiving and one jumps out of the plane and uh, one pulls the cord and the parachute doesn't open. And one pulls again and it still doesn't open. And one realizes after a few sinking moments that it's not going to open. So what does one do at that point? One's plummeting to earth. One's only got a few minutes left till one lands. And the Rambam would say, well, just experience those next three minutes. Live those three minutes, because what else can you do? That's all you've got. Use those three minutes for something good. Enjoy the view. Meditate upon on God. Appreciate those few minutes of life. Now, this is a very tough and stark message. But the truth is we have no choice but to embrace it. Because all of us are in that planet, in that 
sky jive where the parachute hasn't opened. All of us are in that experience where hopefully it's not three minutes, it's three decades or more, 120 years on Earth. But ultimately, the parachute isn't going to close and we're going to land. And therefore, the most we can do is just appreciate those free gifts of life. And this isn't meant to be depressing. We're meant to wake up every morning with, with the words of thanks on our lips, and look at the end of our bed and see a pile, an enormous heap of presents. And the heap of presents are the seconds that we have today. But now let's use them and enjoy them fully. Because every moment of life is a gift that's got granted to us. And again, perhaps we only appreciate that when life is threatened. And this is a very sad thing. Torah is meant to be a consciousness raising system. It's meant to allow us to appreciate that which we have before it's taken away from us. You know, we all have that experience sometimes in which you've uh, once had a cold and perhaps a sore throat and a blocked nose and one's just feeling rotten. And then one day one wakes up and, and the sore th throat has gone and one's able to breathe again through one's nose. And one just feels so alive and happy to be alive and appreciative of being alive. And every breath one takes is just a sheer pleasure for the first few days after that cold is over. And then we get back to normal life and we forget how much pleasure there is in breathing. And one way of looking at the Torah is it's meant to be a consciousness raising system. It's meant to allow us to notice the gifts of life, not when they're threatened and they might be taken away from us, but when we have them every minute. The Talmud tells us, kol neshama ka, that's how kol neshima on neshima, on every breath we take, we ought to be able to thank God. Imagine what life would be like if every breath we took, we could enjoy the experience of breathing and savor it. And so much of the time we don't appreciate the working of our body, our livers and our kidneys that are constantly performing duty unnoticed and unappreciated until God forbid the health, our health or the health of someone near and dear to us is threatened. And the Torah is trying to teach us to go through life noticing and appreciating its blessings. This is the concept of saying a bracha, a blessing on food before we have it. Rather than just eating it without noticing, we stop and for a few moments we reflect and we meditate and we look at that delicious fruit we have in our hands and perhaps we think about how much work went into allowing us to have that simple orange which has been imported from a faraway land and grown by a faraway farmer who will never meet. And this is the concept of making a blessing, a bracha before we eat it, to allow us to experience life at those moments in a true manner and appreciate those gifts of those precious but finite seconds that we have. And this is what the Torah means when it tells us again and again, choose life. The choice we face as human beings is, do we want to drift through life unaware, not noticing the gifts? Or do we want to experience every moment conscious that this is a gift given to us altruistically by an all-giving God? And this is one way of interpreting what the Torah means when it promises us bracha, blessing in our lives. It's telling us that we can make the choices about what we see and what we experience in life. In the Rambam's thinking, it's not some form of externalized intervention of a God who's constantly tweaking the course of history and the course of the world that's bringing bracha and blessing into our lives. But it's because God in his infinite wisdom built into the system of life. That if we live a life of meaning and values, then we will see blessing, we will see bracha in our lives. And that means both in the perspective that we bring to it and also ultimately in the functioning of society. A society that views the world as the random fluctuations of an indifferent universe, a world in which there is no absolute moral and value and no absolute truth even, a universe which is indifferent to human existence, a society which embraces decadence and materialism is a society which will tear itself apart. Built into the system of how God designed this world is that we human beings need meaning and purpose and a sense of spirituality and awareness that we're not just physical beings, but that we're spiritual beings. Built into the system is only through that can we live a life which flourishes and which is truly blessed. So in direct answer to your question, what does it mean when the Torah promises us blessing if we keep the Torah? In the Ramam's thinking, it means two things. It will allow us to see the blessing in our lives and it will allow us ultimately to build a society which allows bracha, blessing, to flourish. Because if we don't choose life, then we're choosing death, we're choosing decadence, we're choosing materialism, we're choosing a life empty of values, and that isn't a life that can allow society to flourish. It's not a life that can allow society to be blessed. Do individuals have a guarantee of living a rich physical life, a material life, if they keep the Torah? Clearly not. There are those who prosper, and there are those who don't. 
But if we want as humans to be able to have a life of blessing, if we want to build a society that has a hope of blessing, then Torah is telling us we need to embrace spirituality and meaning and purpose in our lives. Otherwise, we will descend into decadence and destruction. Well, that's very powerful. And, and I've heard some other rabbis, perhaps from other uh, streams, maybe like the Breslov uh, worldview uh, philosophy, which says that, or seems to uh, argue that one way of viewing challenges in people's lives, it, it, it's sort of like God is knocking at the door, asking us to become appreciative of what we already have, asking us to talk to him, to engage in him. And, and do you think that, do you personally, what do you think of the view that if you do sort of step up to that task, then God doesn't need to give a person as much uh, that or is able to take that challenge away. I know the flip side of the danger of that is is you can sometimes end up victim blaming people basically when they're going through challenges and saying you need to do more. So what what do you make of such a a worldview? I think you're right to say that there are different views in Judaism about these matters, but I don't think that there is a sustainable view um, that can argue that only those that suffer must somehow be to blame for their suffering. I think we can look at um, greats in history, uh, in recent history, who suffered the, the tragedies of, of uh, Jewish persecution in the last century and over the last millennia. We can look at the greats that we're told about going back in time, the lives of the forefathers and foremothers, the lives of the great uh, Talmudic sages, and we can see those that had lives which were easier and those, which, uh, those who went through very difficult uh, and uh, hard experiences. And I think that uh, every authentic movement in Judaism needs to recognize that uh, Moshe himself, the, the prophet who uh, experienced God like no other human has, left unanswered the question about the righteous suffering and the wicked prospering. And uh, the idea that somehow perfect righteousness guarantees an easy and only positive life um, simply isn't one that is true. Uh, suffering, in the classic literature can happen because of punishment, but it can also happen because of uh, a predetermined life experience that one's meant to have. It could be this is a uh, uh, story of one's life and one needs to uh, deal with the experiences in the best possible way. And sometimes suffering can be given as a growth opportunity and even as almost a privilege and a chance to uh, um, use it for that which is positive. And therefore, the most we can say is appreciate every moment of life whilst we have it. Appreciate the gift of life. Express our appreciation to God. Use it well and use it for purpose. And perhaps also express the love that we feel to those who are near and dear to us now while we still have the opportunity. Because what this brings out to us and what the Rambam is arguing is that every moment of life is precious. Every moment of life is an undeserved gift and we don't know when it will stop. And therefore, the most we can say is appreciate what we have use it to draw close to God and use it to draw close to our fellow human beings to express that love whilst we have the opportunity. And is there no value? Are you say, I mean, I presume you're not saying you're, I presume you're not saying that there's no value towards introspection, prayer, evaluating one's deeds when they experience suffering. As far as I understand it, the Talmud itself says that one should should do that. Uh, not to say necessarily that someone is being punished when they're experiencing a suffering, it might not be, but that it's that it's uh, it doesn't hurt. Perhaps it's saying that. What what would you say to that? Absolutely, one should um, use a difficult time as a chance for introspection, a chance for to shove our repentance and improvement. But this isn't because one's looking backwards and trying to speculate about why this has happened, and claim some near prophetic insight into why this thing has happened and why the world runs the way it is. It's more about being forward facing and saying, I'm going through this difficult time. It's a wake up call to me to think about whether I'm using every moment of life in the best possible way. It's forward looking rather than backward looking. It's saying this has happened, that which I held precious, that which I took for granted, I've been reminded cannot be taken for granted. And now how can I use it to the best? And it's incidentally for this reason that the classic mourner's prayer, the Kaddish, if one look at its, look at its content, doesn't say much about the past. It isn't a memorial prayer, prayer in which we look at the past. It's very much forward focused. It's saying, I've suffered this loss, this has happened. Now, how can I make the world a better place? How can I make the world a more harsh place? A place that better reflects the values of spirituality and morality and holiness, which Judaism subscribes to. 
So uh, um, I, I think you are correct. Absolutely, the classic called sources say something that's difficult that happens. You're fush face bemarsov. Look at one's deeds, do introspection. But it's about, at least according to the Rambam, being forward looking in working out how can I improve, how can I learn from this experience, rather than just backwards looking in uh, trying to speculate about why this happens and what the workings of the divine plan are. To stay up to date with JTV content, click subscribe here if you're on YouTube and hit the alarm bell. And if you're on Facebook, hit the like button and under following, click see first. If you enjoy watching JTV content and want to help us continue to grow, please consider making a donation to us by clicking here.